Hello, my name's Philip Dawson and I'd like to talk with you about feedback about teaching. So specifically we're going to be talking about criteria we might use to get feedback. Uh, the, the sources of that feedback, instruments, tools we can use to gather feedback and any ethical considerations that might surround getting feedback from students or anyone else about our teaching. And I want to start off with this disclaimer that SETU is not a measure for learning. Monash and a lot of other Australian universities have instruments like a student evaluation of teaching and units tool where students rate on a Likert scale 1 to 5 about various things. You should not assume that good SETU, a lot of fives, is equal to good learning when research actually exists to the contrary. For example, um, Sitzman et al's meta-analysis which found a strong statistically significant correlation between relationships and student evaluations. So a student's feeling that they have good relationships with their peers and their teacher led to good setu. Or, or was, was correlated with, sorry, I'm not claiming a causal relationship there, let me make that clear, and a weak statistically significant correlation between learning and student evaluations. So there's more of a strong connection between a perception of good relationships with your fellow peers and your teacher than there is with learning and student evaluations. So I stress to you here, we get this feedback, it is really important, but it's not a proxy for measuring learning. So let's think about what criteria do matter to us, because before we were talking about, you know, the quality of the relationships might be something, learning might be something, but what matters to you? Satisfaction is one thing, those student evaluation questionnaires are sometimes thought of as a customer satisfaction questionnaire and for that they might be pretty useful. Learning, well as we discussed before they're not really the best thing to measure learning so we might use other ways to measure the criterion of learning. Retention, it might be really important to us that students who enrol in our unit actually stay in it and pass and stay retained at the institution, that might be a measure of if our unit of study is a good one. Pass-fail rate could be another thing. And I have pass and fail there because is a unit that has a 100% pass rate a good unit? Well, maybe. But maybe a unit that has a really high fail rate is a good one. Maybe it's, it's rigorous then. This is a judgment. Maybe a good unit is a cheap unit. Maybe good teaching is cost effective. So if I can teach a thousand students the same stuff for the same cost it takes you to teach a hundred students, then perhaps I'm the better teacher. Now, again, this is just another potential criterion to evaluate effective teaching. Maybe employability is the thing. Maybe if all my students go and get jobs and your students don't, maybe that's feedback to me that I'm the better teacher. Or maybe it's the sort of employment they get, where they get that employment. This is just another criterion. Maybe the reputation of my unit is the thing. Maybe we should ask people, have you heard of this unit that Phil teaches? What do you think of it? Even if you haven't done it, what's the reputation? What's the reputation of the institution? So criteria matter. The questions we ask influence the answers that we're given and the criteria should drive those. So if we go and we gather data from students about our teaching, we've got to jump back first to the criteria. What is it that we want to measure? All those things before are different criteria. We then come up with some sort of tools to gather that data around those criteria. If we jump straight to the tools, we carry with us assumptions. So a lot of the time we jump to judging the quality of teaching through feedback and we jump straight to using a SETU type questionnaire and we say this unit is better than this unit because the SETU is better. That's not necessarily true. It may be that the relationships are better in this one. Uh, there's even other research that looks at really bizarre spurious factors like the sexual attractiveness of the teacher. 
all sorts of bizarre things matter when it comes to that set you. So if we jump straight to that without thinking of the criteria we're trying to evaluate, we're going to have a bad time. So what do I want to know? Popularity or learning? If you're interested in criteria of effective teaching, I encourage you to read that article there. Um, it's a really good one because it looks at different organisational pressures for what criteria might be of effective teaching and also what the scholarly community might think effective teaching is. So here I'm saying when we go to gather feedback, the criteria we gather that feedback around matter. But we can just be really basic and say, how was class this week? We can ask that question to each other. We can ask it to our students. Feedback doesn't have to be a high stakes game. I hope you're asking this question of a colleague or yourself at some stage this week. Think about self-feedback. What feedback do you give to yourself? You could also call this reflective practice if you wanted to, but you may have ideas of my opinions on reflective practice. A reflective journal, a blog, a conversation, some way you can get those thoughts out of your head, the things that keep you up late at night, you can think of as self-feedback. The casual hallway chat is one of the best ways to get feedback about teaching from yourself. I stuffed up that part of the lecture, I went on too long in this part or, or whatever. That sort of feedback can be really efficiently gotten out. You don't need to ask students about that. It's not an epic. Brief, meaningful, useful. We can also gather feedback directly from students. We can categorise or chunk this in a number of ways. Here I've got formative and summative. So formative might be things like an informal student evaluation of teaching and units survey. Um, there you'll see I've got a little screen grab of it. This is a really useful low stakes survey you can give out to students maybe third, fourth, fifth week of semester. It asks them some really basic questions like what are the best things about this unit, what things in this unit need improvement the most, etc. Nice open questions can give you some rich data and highlight some really obvious things that you might have just missed. It can also make you feel good about the things you're doing well. Informal discussions with students are awesome. Grab them at the end of class. Have that chat. Grab the student who wasn't paying attention, not just the one who's always asking the questions. So we've also got summative surveys like SETU, which is that survey that we mentioned before. That's at the end of semester. A key difference is the students tell me something in the informal SETU partway through semester, I can do something to help those students make that unit better. The students tell me something in the set you at the end of semester, I can't do anything to help those students. So there's a key formative summative difference. The formal complaint at the end of semester, someone tells you ahead of school they thought your lectures were boring or the course wasn't relevant to what they want to do, you can think of that as summative feedback. Critical, negative, but still a form of summative feedback. A post on a discussion board asking for feedback about a particular area. You could ask, what's the most important thing in this week's lecture? What's the most challenging thing in this week's lecture? How confident do you feel about applying formula X to this sort of problem? Summative could be contacting students to complete a formal course review. So here we've got a range of types of feedback. I like to focus mostly on the formative feedback because if you tell me something before I'm finished teaching with you, we can do something to make that better. Quantitative and qualitative is another way we could divide some sort of dichotomy here. A quantitative might be things like the one to five boxes on the set you. Other questions like how much time do you spend on this unit? What's your preference between the lectures and the tutorials? Uh, would you prefer the lectures were online or not? How much do you know about topic X? Um, we can find this out by giving you a, a task to work on. It might not even be accessible. It might be a sort of one minute paper in the tutorial that we give you. You fill it out and we analyse it afterwards and find out that there's this key lack of understanding of this core concept of the unit. So that's one way we could gauge learning. Um, this sort of gauging of learning can be just as enlightening as asking them how they're feeling or thinking about the unit. 
how confident are you with this thing? Those sorts of things. And I guess the other thing with quantitative is it can be a census or a sample. Don't feel that you always have to ask every student to get some sort of rigorous quantitative result. If you have a thousand students, you don't have to survey all of them. You might want to think about getting some sort of representative sample of them or some intelligent sort of sample that you've devised. Qualitative dichotomy side, we could have, yeah, the set you again. We might ask you some open questions. We can talk with you about your experiences. Ask what sort of improvements you'd like to see. Try and really gauge deeply your understanding. Having a little bit of a focus group partway through semester and really probing for deep understanding about concepts can be quite enlightening about what you can do to help improve that. We can go for depth and we can also get the unexpected. If the light bulb in the lecture theatre is flickering and distracting all of the students, they might not get a chance to answer a question that's quantitative about how many light bulbs were flickering in the lecture theatre. They will tell you if you give them that unstructured, open ability. Interpreting feedback is an art. And it's a science. It's something you get better at. It's research as well. There are a body of papers in the field of the scholarship of learning and teaching where people have essentially done some educational intervention and asked students what they thought of it. This is essentially using feedback and the interpretation of it as a research method. I recommend you pair up with a colleague. The next time you get some feedback, find a colleague who's also got some feedback and sit down and share it. It can be really hard to open yourself up like that, but sometimes they might be able to find a different spin off of it or tell you which bits are really matter. So that one thing that stands out like a sore thumb out of a hundred comments doesn't hurt you as much and you are able to focus on the 99 comments that say something else. I also encourage you to have a feedback apprenticeship with your tutors. When your tutors get some sort of feedback, I think it can be really helpful to them if you sit down and work through that feedback. What does the feedback mean? What does it tell you? So I strongly encourage you to try that if you lead some sort of teaching team. And I also really encourage you to not overemphasize negative feedback. There'll always be that one person who didn't like you for no particular reason. I wouldn't encourage you to focus too much on them. However, that's not to say you should discount things that you can turn into some constructive improvement of the unit. But if you've got 99% of the students saying, wow, this unit had such great practical outcomes, and 1% saying it was too hard, I'd be really disappointed if you made the unit easier as a result. Because most of the students are finding something really applicable and useful here. So it's hard to give some universal rules about how you can better interpret feedback. I guess I'll stress to you, it's an art and a science and it's best done as a shared process with a peer. Talking about peers, peer observation of teaching is a phenomenon. It's becoming bigger and bigger that we may get a colleague to come in and observe our teaching, to go onto our Moodle site and make comments to us about the site, to observe as an equal, some other aspect of our teaching. And this is scary, threatening and unnerving. It's also the best thing I've done to improve my teaching. It was worth the scare. Having a colleague observe what I do in the classroom and online has been very helpful. It's shown me things that I do that I don't know that I do that can be quite counterproductive and that are really easy to fix. It's also led to an ongoing, enduring collaboration with that peer because we got to understand each other more deeply as teachers. Monash has a peer observation instrument. Uh, I guess the good thing about this instrument is that it has institutional endorsement and it's supposed to be able to be used for promotion if it's administered in a certain way. And I've got a link to that and there's documentation about how you're supposed to use that. 
So I encourage you to have a look at that instrument and see if you might want to use it with a peer for your own teaching. And when giving and receiving feedback about learning and teaching, I encourage you to take this mantra again, learning is what the student does. So focus on what the students are doing and give feedback about that. The stuttering, the long pauses, etc. Yeah, they, they might be things to give some feedback about. But the student asleep at the back of the class is probably something more to focus on. So when you're observing your peers teach, observe what a student's doing and focus on that and ways that we might be able to work together to improve what they do. I also think you should consider the whole unit, not just lecturing. Yes, you might go along and observe a lecture and that's great and, and really helpful and it's a key part of teaching, but how's the curriculum structured? Does the specification of the assignments make sense? Are the online resources structured in a way that immediately makes sense to you? All of those things still count as teaching and they're things you as a peer can give feedback about. I also think you should consider a feedback triad. The person who's being given feedback, the self, a student who's involved in this, and an observer, your peer observer. And perhaps run it in that order, where someone gives them self-feedback. This means they'll say a lot of stuff that you spotted in their teaching that was terrible, but they're aware of it, so you don't need to rub it in. Great. The self. Then the student gives some feedback and then the observer, and then the person who is teaching gets to respond to that and perhaps even talk about ways they could improve and give concrete examples. Saying the lecture was boring is not a concrete example. Saying, I noticed that when you were giving this part of the lecture on this slide and talking about this concept, uh, looked to be glazed eyes in the room and I'm, I'm wondering what we could do differently. Concrete examples are better than the vibe when it comes to feedback, because you can't change the vibe. And consider the old compliment sandwich, which is the nice thing, the constructive thing, and then the nice thing. Uh, Monash also has been part of the peer assisted teaching scheme, thanks to an ALTC and now OLT, which is the Office for Learning and Teaching funded fellowship or actually two fellowships. I like the PATS guide, and I've got a link there. It has a really good concise introduction to the peer review of teaching on those particular pages, and I encourage you to have a read of it and consider using the instrument in Appendix 3 to conduct a peer review. It's a different instrument to the Monash official one, but have a look at them both and see which one you think works best for you if you're considering doing some peer observation of teaching. I like the peer assisted teaching scheme because it sits the peer observation of teaching in sort of a broader relationship between people and also looks at what you could do to improve. So I encourage you to have a look at that. Now, when it comes to feedback, we ask students to do a lot of stuff for us. We ask them to fill out a lot of surveys, we do stuff with that data. Is it actually ethical for us to do this? Now, I've consulted the literature a number of times and I can't see a lot written about the ethics of student feedback, but there is this one really useful study by McCormack. And through a grounded theory study on feedback about learning and teaching, four principles were identified, four sort of overarching themes, autonomy and justice, respect for students' opinions, anonymity and confidentiality and privacy. And I encourage you to have a look at the paper if you're interested in this ethical side of student feedback. To take just one of these, which is respect for students' opinions, um, we've got here three really implementable principles. So when we're doing collecting feedback from students. Uh, the argument here is that students should be aware of the purpose of the evaluation. Why are we collecting this feedback data from them? Is it for promotion? Is it for research? Is it because we want to do some secret, unexplainable thing? Well, some of those are ethical, some aren't. Students should be aware of why it is that they're doing this feedback. 
they should be aware of the teaching and learning actions arising from the collection of evaluative data. So we get the feedback, what are we going to do with it? How will we improve the learning and teaching and how are we going to communicate that to them? And actions arising from students' feedback should contribute to the improvement of learning and teaching. Uh, the ethics of, say, asking our students for feedback such that we can identify which lecture was the worst one and not offer that lecture because we want to cut costs is of questionable ethics. So these are principles that we might want to consider about collecting feedback data from students. I encourage you to have a look at this paper if the ethics of feedback is of interest. And we'll finish on a bit of a tip. My set you tip is to get and act on feedback and this connects back to some of those ethical principles. Also you should make a big deal about it. So the phrase to say, I want feedback now when I can do something about it. Don't give it to me at the end of semester when I can't use it to help you. Thank you very much for this feedback. It's really helpful. I know you'll feel a little bit like you work, work at McDonald's and you're getting a customer complaint about a hamburger being too cold or whatever, but thank them for their kind feedback. And finally, thanks to your feedback, I have and what actions have you taken from that feedback. As a final caveat to this though, it can be really helpful to make clear to students what the boundaries are of what you can do with their feedback. There will be some things that you can't change. The assessment structure in your unit might be set in stone and there's nothing you can do about it. Communicate that to them. Let them know, these are the things I can change, these are the things I can't change right now but will in the future, these are the things that are just part of the regulatory environment. So I encourage you to start using that language of feedback with your students in your classes and I look forward to talking with you about it and as always please give me any feedback you'd like about this lecture or any other part of my teaching and we'll see what I can do. Thanks a lot.